Hi, good morning everyone. This is Seeking Sustainability Live. I'm JJ Walsh and today we have again the amazing Asby Brown. Thank you so much for joining. <laughs> Thank you. So last week we were talking about your work as lead researcher for SafeCast and monitoring radiation and COVID statistics around Japan and around the world. That was really interesting. And I wanted to reserve a different time to talk about your amazing research and study of the Edo Jidai through your book, Just Enough. It's really fantastic. Thanks for joining again. No, thank you. I'm glad uh, that to, to find this interest and happy to talk about it. That's great. So you wrote Just Enough um, in 2010, just before the Tohoku disaster, is that right? Yeah, that's right. Um, and the story of how you know I ended up writing it was, um, you know, I came to Japan uh, in 1985. Basically, I had been, taken a short trip before that, but uh, to enter uh, the the architecture program at University of Tokyo, and my area to focus on was uh, temple carpentry, miyadaiku, and I spent three years researching with Nishioka Tsunekazu, who was really considered the last great temple carpenter of Japan, who passed away in the early 1990s. And when I would spend time with him. Um, Almost every question I would give, like, why do you cut the wood this way, or why do you shape it this way, or why do you use these trees, his reply would would always emphasize environmental aspects, um, understanding the importance of understanding the environment, understanding how the environment shapes trees and other living things, and, you know, the roles of moisture and weather and, you know, sunlight and, and all these things. And, and I found this environmental awareness to be really remarkable. And, and kind of unexpected that his thinking would center so much on that. And as I spent time in Japan, pretty much every craftsperson I met, whether it was Urushi or Washi or anything, they shared a similar outlook. And I thought this is very, very important. Um, after you know writing a, a book about temple carpentry called The Genius of uh, Japanese Carpentry, which I hope one day we can talk about, um, I studied other things like compact housing and, and looking at the sort of low footprint housing, low, low ecological footprint, um, you know, the use of resources and housing and things like that. And I was invited to uh, the Sun Valley Sustainability Conference in 2006. Uh, it was a really, really interesting conference. Um, and the sponsor was Teresa Heinz, who you may have known she passed away, but she was a very major, uh, you know, supporter and philanthropist supporting sustainability. Uh, William McDonough, architect of sustainability, also so the co-author of Cradle to Cradle. He was the person who directly invited me after having seen my books, and they wanted to hear about this compact housing. When I was there, I saw that uh, all of these experts in different fields, whether it was agriculture, energy, uh, water use, um, you know, people working on the prairie, people, you know, working in forestry, people working in waste management, they were, they had begun to share a language and and to understand how their specific areas of focus uh, were influenced by and also exerted influence on other areas and and it was a point where finally they had been many of these people had been working on this for decades by then and they said yes you know I can't really deal with the forest issues without understanding the the water the the, the, the watershed the rivers I can't understand agriculture without understanding um, you know waste flows and other things so it was really kind of an interesting perspective. And, and in my conversations, I realized that people may be interested to know how Edo period Japan managed to deal with this extreme limit of resources, high population, uh, other aspects, you know, for, for 250 years during the Edo period. Because at the time I had heard lots of anecdotes about, oh, Edo people recycled everything or Edo people had very efficient agriculture or they had all these other things. And I decided to dive into that. And that really began in 2006. Six after I returned from that conference. Um, now I had studied uh, wooden architecture, and I was very familiar with a lot of aspects of, you know, farms and farmhouses and, and things, things like that. But this uh, enabled me to focus on some other aspects. So, um, and I focused on the connections, and that is kind of how the book uh, developed. Yeah, it's wonderful. I'd love to talk a little bit about the title in a minute. I love that title of the conference that you went to. Wasn't it called Economics of Happiness in Berkeley or something? Yes. What a fantastic that title. That was an interesting one. 
Yes, yes, that was um, uh, Helena Norberg Hodge has uh, a, a beautiful. She wrote a book called Ancient Futures, and uh, through people that I, I I know and have worked with in Japan, I was invited to present at that. Also, I'm trying to think that was after, maybe right before 2000, uh, rather rather three three eleven. Um, oh no, it was after after that. And um, uh, those are people. A, a lot of the focus of that conference and those people are in indigenous knowledge. Uh, which, as you know, is becoming recognized, you know, throughout the world as a very important uh, thing to understand. And I have uh, people I've worked with and people I've mentored who focus on indigenous knowledge. And there's I was presenting, a, um, you know, Japan some, as one example. There's so many things from your book when you talk about the agricultural system, using the nature's flow of using the valleys mm -hmm. that are so similar to indigenous Hawaiian style farming. So other I saw people so have many pointed parallels. That out. Yeah. Yes. Other people have pointed that out, and that was interesting. But, you know, as you know, JJ, a lot of people, I mean, it, cultures around the world have sh shared similar conditions. I mean, if you look at them in an abstract sense, sh similar conditions needed to maximize the use of the, the natural uh, flow, the natural benefits, uh, the topography, um, avoiding, um, you know, unnecessary inputs of energy, um, you know, trying to use you know, rain and terrain and watershed and, and, and sunlight, et cetera, as, as much as possible. This was just a given through, through most cultures. Uh, and it's something that really, as we know, uh, through the industrial age, uh, we've been able to, uh, get away from, which may have had some important benefits in some ways, but actually uh, can be probably very, very wasteful. And um, we can benefit a lot from understanding how people used to do this and sort of understand the thinking. I mean, not, not saying people should adopt those earlier technologies, but to understand the thinking and the understanding of the environment that enabled people to uh, come up with those good solutions. Um, we're, we'll talk about that a bit more later. Um, uh -huh. I'd love to uh -huh. have you explain the idea of just enough. I'm showing the image uh -huh. from the temple that you got the uh -huh. the title from. Can the you Tsukubai? tell us? The, the yeah. water basin? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, Japan was fortunate to have had an ethical and value system that sort of not prohibited, but discouraged people from living a wasteful lifestyle, from overconsumption. Now, with great exceptions, particularly in in the urban areas, like in the city of Edo, the wealthier, you know, uh, business people, the merchants, you know, they often did have conspicuous consumption, with the the government would often try to tamp down on. But there was this value of of living with just enough. And this tsukubai, it says ware tada taru wo shiru. And it's often just referred to as taro shiru, which means understanding enough or knowing enough or knowing what is enough. And this is Zen Buddhist, actually. Uh, this is from Ryuanji Temple in Kyoto. And uh, it's, it's, it's a Zen Buddhist thinking, which, of course, um, emphasizes avoiding excess, um, finding uh, what is essential uh, and, and um, trying to live a life that's undisturbed with you know, possession, possessions and, and, and des desires that you don't need, etc. It also is reflected to some degree in traditional Shinto understanding of the humans, uh, human beings place in the world, uh, that we are um, one of the, the smaller entities uh, in the world uh, compared to the gods who are often natural forces, whether it's sun or, or, or moon or wind or mountains or rivers or trees, that we are actually very, very dependent and interdependent uh, and that um, somehow losing sense of the necessary balance will create uh, problems. And uh, so these are kind of shared values that really, really made it easier for Jap Japanese people in the Edo period to to live a frugal lifestyles and to maximize their use of these limited resources. And I have to stress, I can't stress enough that the key problem was the lack of resources and uh, and how they dealt with that. It's really interesting. And I, I think a lot of people think of sustainability solutions as too hard or giving up something. Um, but yesterday mm -hmm. I was talking to two rural entrepreneurs who have moved out to the countryside to start businesses and move their families. And they talk about your priorities change. You start thinking mm -hmm. of what is necessary for your life in a different way. And I think that is so tied in with a lot of the concepts that you found from your research is what what is necessary for life, right? Yeah. Um, you know. 
J- j- you know, in the Edo period, Japan was a feudal society. It was a caste society, and and uh, depending on your station in life, uh, the, what was available to you was was limited, to some degree. Uh, and so it's it's hard to com- really to compare uh, people living in that kind of society with our situation, our expectations. I think many of us would bristle at the lack of personal freedom or the recognition of of rights. Um, you know, even basic the right to your own life, um, you know, because of samurai had this uh, technical uh, right to kill anybody for any reason. Uh, and and yet within that, people had a lot of freedom. And um, there was constant reinforcement of social bonds, uh, both, you know, through sort of natural, the natural expansion of family groups, uh, community groups, village groups, these connections, uh, you know, intermarriage relationships, etc. Lots of societies, social groups, mutual support, etc. Lots of situations where people would pitch in together to do certain important tasks. Uh, and, and the meaning of life was somehow different, not just about consumption, but it was certainly about having enough and having an adequate uh, subsistence or, or, or existence. Uh, and over the course of the Edo period, which you know began in, in 1603, when Tokugawa Ieyasu united the nation after basically centuries of, of, of civil war, fighting, etc., um, over the course of the 250 years until 1868, when the Meiji period began, um, you know, really there was a constantly increasing quality of life. I mean, based on all the research that we see, whether it means the, the amount and quality of food available, to housing, to clothing, to education, literacy, um, it was basically this idea of, you know, raising all ships at once, all boats raised at once. And and this is, you know, a lot of it has to do with governance. Uh, and I mentioned that in the, the, the made, uh, rather the uh, Edo government, the Bakufu, you know, the, the Tokugawa shoguns, uh, and also the various daimyo would often have to issue edicts against overconsumption, against luxury. Um, they would often have to do that. But in general, the governance was really exercised with a fairly light hand in a lot of ways. Uh, the central government sort of left it to the individual uh, domains, the Han. Uh, they let them figure things out at the moment. They'll say, well, we need to do something about forest. What are you going to do? We need to do something about rivers. What are you going to do? We need to grow more cotton. What are you, what are you going to do? Uh, but they didn't really exert a, a heavy hand. And it actually, you know, there's research. I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Tanaka Yuko-sensei, from Jose Daigaku. She's a brilliant uh, researcher for Edo, has written many, many influential books uh, going back to the 1990s. And she pointed out that there was a kind of, you know, Confucian basis. Uh, researchers, one particular person named Kumuzawa Bunzan, who wrote uh, specifically about governance and the notion that the purpose of, um, of governance uh, and of life of the nation is not to amass wealth. It's not about money, and it's certainly not about getting a lot of money in the hands of a few people. It's about taking care of the subjects of the ruler and making sure they have what they need. And in a situation like Japan, this means really uh, finding a way to to stretch and distribute those limited resources as much as possible to as many people as possible. And of course, there were better rulers and worse rulers, and and often this failed. Often there were problems, but overall, we saw that it was a, a very effective uh, way, and really rooted in this notion of the responsibility of the ruler to the populace. Now, of course, the bakufu, the daimyo, they amassed great wealth. Uh, and they lived in a way a very opulent lifestyle, and this was rather parasitic because all the farmers were paying a big proportion of their rice uh, crop every year as tax, supporting all of the samurai who, over the course of the Edo period, really didn't have any fighting to do. They were really sort of a parasitical, bureaucratic, you know, caste. So this was one of the basic problems underneath that. Meanwhile, on the other side, the merchants, particularly in a place like Edo, amassed great wealth. Uh, some of them have became very, very wealthy, more powerful in terms of their income than a lot of the uh, feudal lords, the daimyo, who would be, become in debt to these people. So it was skewed and it, it wasn't really uh, sustainable in its economic sense uh, for long enough. And that's one of the reasons why the system collapsed uh, and, and the Meiji period was ushered in. So um, there's a lot to think about, about what is uh, good governance, what is um, a good lifestyle, etc. But I just want to add Finally, the the lifestyle of Edo Japan, the things people used, their their material culture was beautiful, often exquisite. Uh, it, there was really no sense of doing without. 
It was more the sense of doing something simply and beautifully, uh, if, if possible. And, uh, and we see that throughout the culture that even now is prized as, as one of the, the, the peak uh, beautiful cultures of the world. Yeah, I think that's a really valid point, not to over-romanticize the idea of Edo Jidai as being a perfect society, but there are so many wonderful solutions embedded in Edo Jidai, which I think we can apply to our seeking sustainability in our modern lives. I, I love this quote from your book when you say, the solutions were inherently local ones, arrived at with almost no input from beyond Japan, other than what the mm. ocean and the atmosphere brought directly. And I think this is, this is sometimes a problem when people are looking for solutions. In, so I, I, as a consultant, I'll often say, let's look back. What did you used to do you know, before plastic? Mm -hmm. Or what did you used to do 20 years ago? And, and let's see if that might work now. And um, there are a lot of great solutions from within Japan, especially during this Edo period. So uh, I'd like to yeah. talk about some of your examples today, like um, yeah. the Sento. Let's dive in. Can you walk sure. us through the Sento? Yeah, um, one, you know, one of the terms that I use is multi-form solution. And uh, because, again, what we're going to learn from Edo, I think, mostly, it's, it's not necessarily governance. We can learn something about values through Zen, maybe through Shinto, understanding of nature. There's a lot uh, uh, that we can dwell on from that. But I think uh, this notion of resource use, understanding how things are connected and how making a change in one area can have an effect in another area and they can beneficially reinforce each other. I call these multi-form solutions. And, you know, we have the, the notion of killing two birds with one stone. And I often point out that in Edo, often you have solutions that kill five or six birds with one stone, you know, somehow finding a way to just slice this problem right down the middle and and have benefits that spill off and cascade in many directions and the sento is kind of a very instructive example so sento are japanese bathhouses and uh you know they were very very common in the Edo period japanese people always loved baths now it was not possible for most uh households to have their own bath if you were in a farming household you, you may have a you know a b big barrel that you would use as a bathtub uh, but in urban centers, you'd have to be fairly wealthy to have a private bath. So everyone went to the Sento. And what happens at the Sento is that in one day, one afternoon, evening, about 200 or 300 people can use the bath. Uh, and there would be a very large tub uh, and people could get in. Uh, and, and this means that um, the, the amount of fuel that is necessary to heat that water uh, it is much less than it would have been if these people were sort of individually trying to heat baths for each household, really uh, tens of times uh, less fuel. And and it it's not that someone uh, from the top said, oh, we need to come up with a solution to, you know, maximize the use of fuel for people to bathe. Uh, and so, oh, here's this idea. No, it just sort of emerged naturally as an economic approach. The people who would operate the centos realized that this was a huge economy and, and people would come. And it was a very social space as well. And one thing that I learned, which surprised me, was, you know, when you would go into the Cento, uh, you know, you'd pay, pay your money, just like if you go to one of these little onsen these days, you know, neighborhood onsen. Uh, you, know, you pay your money, uh, you, know, you put your clothes in a locker, uh, you go to the changing room, you know, and, and your, your basic admission fee would, would give you one bucket of hot water for your personal use. Just one bucket. Uh, you could use all the cold water you wanted. You could get in the hot bathtub as much as you wanted, uh, but you only got one bucket. And this, again, is because, you know, the, the cost of energy is high. Why is the cost of energy high? Because it depends on forest resources, depends on wood. All the fuel was either wood or charcoal. Uh, and so this is something that one of the big problems before the Edo period was over uh, overcutting deforestation. So there was this conscious desire to to you know, minimize the use of uh, fuel resources, and this is one one aspect of that. So we, I say that you know, in our society, uh, we're very specialized. So you'll have people who will specialize in, like, like I mentioned, for the sustainability people in water or forestry or uh, agriculture or waste or something else. Uh, rarely are we encouraged in our education in our training to look at how these things influence each other, these connections, maybe more so now than before because of this understanding uh, of our, our issues with climate and environment. But uh, it was very unusual. But this idea of, oh, if you minimize the use of fuel, 
for uh, uh, making hot water, then you are actually helping with two issues, the water issue and the fuel issue. Uh, meanwhile, in the bath, this is making people clean. Uh, this sort of hygiene, Jap Japanese people, often they are renowned for having good hygiene, which we've seen uh, in the past year under coronavirus has probably been of great, great health. So this you know, better hygiene is better for health in general. Uh, so you have fewer, you know, diseases and communicable diseases and problems like that. So this Cento as an institution has economic benefit. It has a benefit for fuel. It has a benefit for hygiene. And it has a great social benefit because these were primary social spaces as well. Just a beautiful, beautiful approach. Yeah, it's wonderful. And the fact that Centos in Japan are now dying out, if we want to have a more sustainable future, we should really support and encourage the centos to stay open because not only are they more efficient in terms of water use, energy use, um, instead of everybody doing bath or shower in their own hotel or in their own house, um, it's also a way to keep the culture and the heritage of this idea going and uh, bring communities together. It might be tricky during COVID, um, but I, yeah. I love the idea of centos and onsens being supported. Yeah. And it's interesting that now they are more of a luxury. People go for fun, for something special. I mean, there's one in our neighborhood, not, not too far away. Well, you know, actually, it, it, you have to drive to get there, but uh, you can get a massage, you can have something to eat, you know, it's kind of a fun social place. Um, you know, fortunately, though, we have other ways to generate hot water that don't necessarily require fossil fuel. So I think as our general energy systems shift to, um, you know, renewable energy, to solar energy, et cetera, et cetera, that maybe some of these problems may be less so. And I look at Japanese baths and hot water systems, I think they're very advanced and actually very, very efficient and getting better. But yes, it's true. You know, this general shift towards emphasizing privacy um, in Japanese society, uh, you know, often to the to the expense at the expense of social social connection, social bonds is is, I think, a problem. And not just in Japan, in many places. But yeah, now uh, it's unfortunate. I remember when I first came to Japan, I met um, an American who was a student, uh, and he lived in this very, very small apartment in Shinjuku, and there was no bath there. Uh, and we would go to the Sento. And it was really interesting. And this is one thing, you know, uh, I was so frustrated because, you know, you'd go there, there'd be a shower, or you'd have the little spigot to fill your, your little bucket, and you had this lever that you would push down, and the water would come out, right? The hot water come out. And then after 30 seconds, it, the lever had come back up and it shut off. And I was really annoyed by that. I thought, oh, God, I hate that. You know, why don't I have, why can't I have hot water? And then as, as I was researching the center, I realized, oh, in the old days, you would only get one bucket. So this is really the same uh, notion of conserving this hot water that in the modern period, this is probably a Showa era invention, this sort of spring, you know, handle, I think, um, it was really the same thinking, which persisted. Uh, and in a similar way, we talk about bath and water, etc. Nowadays, like 60% of Japanese households use uh, the bath water uh, for for doing their laundry. And all every washing machine in Japan has this attachment to attach a hose uh, to the bath to use that water. So this is technically gray water, Although in, in Japan, of course, the baths are very clean because, you know, people have scrubbed off outside the tub. So when they get in the tub, it's not that dirty. So this is a very, for me, a very Edo way of thinking to use that bath water then for, for laundry and to reuse this gray water. Uh, absolutely. It's a great idea. We do it at our house. And because a lot of mm -hmm. the washing machines in Japan do not have a warm or hot cycle, if we do uh. the hose after a bath in the evening after everybody's used it, it's warm water and then you can get it's your warm water. warm water wash in so your you're washing using machine. that residual heat yes, using that residual heat <laughs> instead of sending it down the drain right yeah. i mean i was also impressed when i first came to japan i did homestay and uh to, I, when seeing this sort of insulated cover that they would put over the bathtub i thought wow what a brilliant idea because the next day it's still a little bit warm and you don't need to do as much to heat it and you know one thing i don't know if you want to talk about this now but there's something called gyozi uh, which is, you know, you might consider it is cat cat bath, cat bath, you know, and and this was very common and particularly in rural areas to leave a big, you know, pot of water out in the sun all day, and it would get warm. It, it's lukewarm. It's warm. It's not hot. 
Uh, but it, but in the evening, if you're going to wash off of that, it's actually pretty nice. And there's no need to use any fuel whatsoever for that. And this was very, very common. Say, so, okay, the, the, the sunlight can actually uh, provide a source of heat uh, enough for this water. So this is also, we think of these vectors, you know, the solar energy uh, helping to make the hot water. And this sort of thinking actually occurs in other places in certain agricultural uh, uses to 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 um, you know use the solar energy to heat water for agricultural use or for other other things as well. So it's a, a beautiful thing. Of course, you could use that same warm water then if you're going to make tea with it. Then that also minimizes the need the the need for fuel. And then uh, we're on the issue of hot water. Over time, um, you know, Japanese uh, teapots would be on a little three-legged stand uh, over the the coals, for instance, uh, to to heat in in a hibachi or in an irori. Uh, and over time, the design was refined so that um, you know actually the bottom of the teapot would be as close to the heat as possible. And this was just this sort of steady process of 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 refinement. You know, it's not like again this. Thinking up at top, someone says, oh, we have to, you know, maximize this little by little. Ah, if we get it closer to the heat, we can use these coals longer and it's easier and less fuel. So this kind of thinking pervaded the culture. Oh, wonderful. Um, also, mm. so about the ideal bath, I've got your uh, thing from one of your talks. You say saves fuel, feels good, reuses water and feeds the plants. So that was that was yes. a great, great concept that they yeah, had very yeah. circular, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, again, um, you know, yeah, uh, again, th this reuse of the water, the gray water in the farmhouse, you know, farm uh, farmstead, it would go to the, the pond, you know, there was a farm pond, which wasn't used for drinking water, but for all the other water uses and, and, and also for irrigation, etc. So this was kind of a, a very, I mean, just a matter of course, of course, you're going to reuse that, you know? Yeah. Speaking mm -hmm. of waste of water, in most modern mm. houses in all over the world, including Japan, mm. the biggest waste of water is through the toilet. And you've got yes. some great insights from Edo Jidai about how they utilized toilet waste. Yeah. Uh, yes, it's a really fascinating subject. Uh, uh, and, you know, maybe a little icky for some people, but... Uh, Again, we talked about these multi-form solutions, killing as many birds with one stone as possible. Uh, if we contrast the situation in Europe and later, you know, certainly in North America, uh, the United States, by the end of the Edo period, you know, America had been existing for over 100 years, um, especially in urban areas. You know, the, the handling of human waste was the cause of a great you know, disease, cholera, lots of problems. Uh, eventually, you know, the flush toilet was developed, which was very hygienic from the point of view of the inside the home. It got that stuff out of the house, but then it's going into the rivers, you know, and it's polluting it. And we're still using a very similar system. Uh, although then we have water treatment, waste treatment plants, and you have to use the chemicals or other, you know, energy inputs uh, to treat this water, to get this waste out of it so that it can be reused for something else. Uh, and we've been doing this for basically a century or, or longer. Uh, in, in Edo period Japan, particularly uh, in the urban areas, the human waste was recycled uh, to use for agricultural fertilizer. And at the beginning of the period, uh, you know, if you were a, a, a homeowner or a landowner, uh, you, let's say you had Nagaya apartments and you had a sort of uh, common uh, uh, latrine toilet, and this is basically a latrine would go down into a pit, you know, you would have to pay someone to come clean it out. I mean, that was the situation at the beginning. And this was, you know, an annoyance and a little bit of an economic burden. But little by little, in, in the drive to in, increase agricultural productivity, uh, and this was something that happened continually through the Edo period, uh, really increasing this productivity, the use of fertilizers became very important. And initially, uh, green fertilizer, what's called karashiki, which is basically, you know, compost, composted uh, green matter, was uh, the most common fertilizer. But there were, other, there were other things that were used. For instance, uh, rapeseed husks were used as fertilizer, so they would press the rapeseed to make oil, and then these husks became like this cake, and that was one fertilizer. The same for sardines would be pressed for oil, and then the sardine, the, the, what's left over, the other stuff was also fertilized. But those were kind of expensive and, uh, you know, needed a certain, uh, you know, uh, access to them. But human waste was everywhere. And little by little, uh, farmers would uh, make deals with, uh, you know, property owners in the city uh, to get access to this human waste. And at first it would be like, I'll take it away from you for free. 
and uh, they would cart it away and and use it. And then it would be like, um, you know, I want to make sure that I can, you know, have access to this next year as well. So let's make a deal, and I will give you some vegetables and stuff, you know, in exchange for that. Well, great. And then it was like, I will pay you to let me take this stuff away. It became a real economic, you know, uh, issue and uh, developed into uh, an infrastructure, uh, a, a shipping infrastructure, a distribution infrastructure with brokers, et cetera, setting prices, you know, competitive bidding for human waste. And it's interesting because the, you know, there was depending on the grade of the waste, uh, you know, the price was different. And, and interestingly, the most expensive waste was from like Yoshiwara from the entertainment district where everyone was eating and feasting, you know, the best quality food, the richest food all the time. And the perception was, and it probably was true that this was the, the, the best fertilizer. So this became very, very common. Now, you know, the way they would treat it would be through hot composting. They'd take it to the farmstead uh, and then they would hot compost it for generally a few months, really. Uh, and, and hot composting actually generates an internal heat enough to kill most microorganisms. Uh, maybe not everything, but we don't hear a lot about parasites. Um, Etc. After the Second War, when this was also done, uh, there were a lot of problems with parasites, I think, because uh, the process could not be carried out uh, efficiently and fully. Um, and nowadays, you know, one of the big problems would be pharmaceuticals. Everyone's taking medicines and this gets into our waste and it's not something that you want to consume if you don't need it. So maybe there's some technological situation back there. But I tell people like, you know, the situation would be like if you had a composting toilet which I saw and used my first composting toilet back in the early 1980s, uh, out of college, working on an uh, interesting ar uh, architecture project with sort of sus subsistence farming. Uh, if everyone had a, and they've developed fantastically over the decades, if you had a composting toilet, uh, and then every month or so, someone would come and pay you like 500 yen, you know, five bucks, to take it away. That would be the similar situation. They're coming to take that away from you. Uh, paying you to take it away. That would be the situation. Uh, it could be beneficial. There must be a way. I hope we can find a way to use it. You know, it's called human manure. I hope there's a way to find a way to use it. But, you know, at present, I do think there are some risks, particularly the pharmaceuticals um, for that. But anyway, to, to, to come back and sort of wrap that up. So the problems that this solved was one, agricultural productivity, two, hygiene. This stuff is not you know, sitting and festering in the city. It's getting out of air. Uh, three, it's not going into the rivers. You're not polluting uh, the water supply with that. Uh, four, it's also providing, you know, economic benefits. So this is like four uh, things that are not solved, but really uh, partly solved by this one uh, infrastructure and this one uh, approach to dealing with this waste. Yeah. And I should mention that all these wonderful sketches that we are looking at are done by you, Asby. I love your yes. drawings. Thank you, thank you. Um, in the book itself, they're all you know black and white line drawings, and then over the the time, I've I've made lots of color versions, and actually hope to make a color version of the book um, if possible. But yes, I love drawing, and um, at the time I was writing this book, I was teaching full time at Kanazawa Institute of Technology. Uh, actually, I was even homeschooling my my son at the time. Uh, I was doing other work, and I would have to find time to do drawing, and the, the drawings took about a year. Uh, but I loved it. I would just sit and start, had all kinds of research material, and I, I can't overstress how much uh, a, a writing a project like this, research like this, depends on prior work by other people, both in Japan and overseas. I mean, basically learning from other people's research and just finding a way to integrate it. But in sitting down to draw, I would just start in the morning and draw till evening, and really until I would get a headache <laughs> from eye strain from drawing, and then look forward to getting to the, the next one the following day. So there's a, a hundred or over a hundred drawings in the book, and I just really, really love doing that. It's, it's a great way to explain these concepts and to get an idea about how things looked um, in at the time. Uh, how did you get the yeah. idea for the drawings? Just by doing research or <clears throat> did you see well, photos? Well, you know, <clears throat> again, research material, uh, lots of photos, other research work by other people, uh, and a lot of site visits. I mean, spending a lot of time uh, going to museums like the Edo Tokyo Museum, visiting, you know, Edo, um, you know, architecture, open air architecture museums. Um, of course, I had studied the architecture a lot, so I was most more familiar with that than a lot of the other things. So finding examples, uh, going to other historical museums, anthropological museums, uh, talking to experts, and, uh, and a lot of visual material, uh, books and publications and things. Uh, and I guess my approach was, you know, I wanted to find a way in each drawing to sort of 
encapsulate the totality and then to show how various aspects, maybe physical parts, interacted with each other, uh, often through exploded views or other things to show how mechanisms worked or how a, a, a process was done. And and one of my inspirations for that was uh, the work of Eric Sloan. Are you familiar with Eric Sloan, American? He, he was New England um, in the 40s and 50s. He did these wonderful books about early American culture and 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 farm you know farm implements and farming and farm buildings and and they were just beautiful beautiful drawings which had inspired me since certainly since my university time and I wanted to do something like that and over time I had I had done several of the books already by the time I started to write this one the 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 carpentry book and then house books and they all include drawings that I had done myself so thinking about how to do something that's visual enough that people can learn a lot just looking at the pictures uh, and another source of inspiration were actually Japanese uh, books from the period about these things, because um, almost every aspect of Japanese life, you have to think about this, it was a very, a very highly literate society. I mean, even in villages, you had like 40% or more literacy uh, in the villages. And for the people who couldn't read, they could learn by looking at illustrations. So this was very, very well developed. Uh, there were books called Nosho, so farming manuals that were published, which would show how you make hose. What kind of different hose do you need to use for different kinds of you know crops you're growing, or you know, how to build a well, or how to do anything? And and they could understand just from looking at the illustrations if they weren't able to read the text. One one thing I heard you talk about in one of your seminars about the manuals coming from the government sent to the communities yeah. to show them how to do yes. some of this innovation or how yeah. to design their communities. That's amazing. Yes. Yeah, the, the motivations, I mean, again, publication, the, the, the publication industry in Japan was very highly developed. And I think it's very well known, almost everything from literature to history to 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 everything else. And and certainly agriculture got a lot of attention. Uh, so often the government would sponsor researchers to learn something, let's say like cotton farming would be a great example, because the government wanted to increase the production of cotton. Uh, initially, they thought it was a very good thing to use for uh, military uniforms and and things because it's very sturdy. Also, it can be washed in a very high temperature compared to um, uh, flax or other asa or other tech, uh, you know, fibers that were being used. So uh, there was a big uh, interest by the on the part of the government to increase its production. So they would, you know, commission researchers to learn everything about cotton farming and to write a book. And, and then these would be published and distributed. And you can you need to picture um, books becoming available uh, uh, by the government coming down to the village headman's house, and he's reading it, and they call a village meeting and say, okay, we want to talk about cotton. You know, who has enough fields to do cotton, and this is how we do it. And they could be reading it for the people who couldn't understand the text, and the others could be handing this thing around and looking at the illustrations. There were also waka, poems, actually songs. Uh, that were uh, training people how to do things agriculturally. So, you know, this, when the moon is this phase uh, and after the last rain, this is the time to do this planting sort of a thing. And th there was this also this sort of oral culture to this that was actually a conscious way of, of training people and passing on this knowledge. So there was this great distribution of knowledge, collection and distribution of knowledge, and the government often played a key role. But also there was a huge commercial publishing industry as well. Uh, and one thing that often happened would be one author would uh, publish a book and then someone would plagiarize it. Uh, there's a lot of copying and plagiarism and then selling the same content basically under a different title and trying to make money on it. Um, let's talk about the farming agriculture uh, ideas that you cover in the book so mm -hmm. beautifully. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the people now who would think about getting into farming think of it as such a big hurdle doing organic farming mm. or you need mm. loads of equipment. But the idea of manual irrigation, designing mm. to use the natural mm. flow, um, the mm. idea of water coming out of the farm cleaner than mm -hmm. it went in. They mm -hmm. were mm -hmm. using a lot of the concepts we are aiming for in agriculture now, right? Yeah. Amazing. Yeah, they were really, you know, possibly really very important models. And again, if not, not for the actual technologies used, uh, but for the overall approach and understanding. So yes, you referred to this, uh, the use of the natural terrain uh, in order to provide water for irrigation. And, uh, the, you know, again, understanding how watersheds operate is 
key to all of this. And it's something that I wish people would pay more attention to. And certainly after the Fukushima disaster is something I was looking at because these same watersheds were carrying cesium through the environment. Uh, basically, it's taking the water from everywhere. And again, you know, I have an illustration uh, maybe we'll be showing. Uh, basically, snow, you know, collects on top of a mountain. That's a huge reservoir. Uh, and in the spring, it starts to melt and gradually is providing this flow of water downstream. Uh, and basically, farms were laid out to take advantage of these natural streams as much as possible. Uh, and at some point, they would need to dig an irrigation channel. They would do that, but trying to use a natural gravity flow. You didn't have to pump things. There would be some cases where you may have to use a kind of a water wheel to raise water, you know, a few, um, a meter or so, or, or a few uh, tens of centimeters. Uh, but basically, uh, they're using gravity flow as much as possible. Uh, there's something called a tameike, which is a holding pond. And again, this could be done artificially now in most places uh, in Japan, these are artificial holding ponds, which are still used. Um, but generally, they would try to use a natural pond to do that. Uh, and and these were sort of also often a wetland, right? Which is you know when the the, the water is coming down, they would fill and expand, and and during the drier times, they would shrink. And and this is a very important you know uh, habitat for lots of uh, animals who live there as well. So the water would come down through. And I'm, again, I'm particularly talking about rice fields, terraced rice fields. Tambo or or or, or uh, uh, you know Shinden, and uh, basically the water is going from one to the next to the next to the next, and then ultimately um, the excess is flowing out uh, back to the watershed and generally into a kind of wetland uh, adjacent to uh, another waterway, a river or or, or a stream. Uh, and researchers uh, within the last decades or so have uh, tested this system and understood that the water that comes out is actually cleaner than the water that's come in in terms of organic matter and other potential pollutants. So I don't think, again, that anyone designed this from the beginning to say, oh, we want the water that comes out to be cleaner than what comes in. They didn't design it that way, but that was the effect, and I think they noticed. So um, it was a very, very sophisticated system that understood this natural flow. And this, unfortunately, was very susceptible to damage to the watershed from other things like forestry, like clear cutting, which would then fill the rivers with silt, uh, and, and this would come down and actually clog the irrigation or make other problems. So uh, it was a real, real problem. And one thing that I realized and was one of those aha moments, I mean, I, I was spending a lot of time in the Kanazawa area um, in, in uh, you know, um, Ishikawa prefecture and uh, beautiful farmlands there and realized that the irrigation channels in many cases were the oldest uh, human infrastructure there. Uh, even if they had been made in concrete, often they were following the same route that they had followed hundreds of years ago, older than a lot of the roads. It's like, wow, this irrigation thing, this is very, very persistent. Uh, it takes a lot of effort to dig these channels, et cetera. So if they work, if the terrain is unchanged, then that route for the water to flow is probably going to remain the same for a long time. Nowadays, of course, you have pumps. You have a lot of uh, technology that's used to do this. But if you go to farms in Japan, it's still pretty low tech. You know, there's a little gate and the guy cranks it up and opens it up and the water flows down. Uh, it's still pretty low tech and very, very, um, you know, uh, very much uh, continuing the way it was done in that same locale uh, centuries before. Yeah. And it's it's such a beautiful design. It doesn't harm the view of the landscape either. It, it's beautiful the way it flows through the valley and the houses are yeah. on the outside or the communities on the outside. And of course, yeah. there, there was very little, if any, food waste. And the upcycling of all the byproducts of rice, which was mm -hmm. the main staple mm -hmm. crop, um, were yeah. very well used. You document that yeah, really well. Yeah, it's a great example when I when we talk about you know full use of a of, of an agricultural product or other resource. Um, in Japan, rice was a, a prime example. And again, uh, the the most economically valuable uh, product of rice farming was uh, white rice, right? Shinmai. And this was actually what needed to be paid uh, as tax to the government by farmers. And this would be sold as the highest value thing. Of course, people were eating a lot of brown rice, genmai, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Of course, still a lot of families couldn't even afford that. They were eating other grains uh, instead. But um, in the process, everything that was you know, sort of taken off in order to get to this kernel of rice was reused. So, for instance, the momigara, the hull, hulls were used. Uh, for instance, 
pillows. Even to these days, you can still get pillows that are filled with momigara, uh, used for abrasives, used for other things. Or it could be then uh, used as compost or maybe even burned or, or even used as fuel. Uh, then when you're getting the, the bran off of the rice, off the brown rice, it's called nuka. Nuka, of course, is used for a lot of things for making pickles, other kind of food production, uh, even for, you know, skin care, you know, a lot of things like that. But the wara, the rice straw, was the thing that amazed me the most because we're familiar in Japan. We understand people use straw for a lot of things, whether it's raincoat or hat or zori sandals or maybe uh, goza, you know, uh, seating cushions, etc. They use it for just about everything. And it was a household craft. Every household was able to do this stuff. Uh, and then when these things would, you know, get to their end of life, uh, they could be burned as fuel. And the Japanese kamado, the, the, the kitchen stove, basically was a very efficient thing that could burn just about anything. Or this could also go back to the agricultural cycle as compost or as fertilizer. Uh, and then, you know, back to producing more food. Uh, even if you burned it, that ash uh, had a lot of potassium and that was valuable for, for, thing, for use in things like uh, metal, uh, you know, metal production, certain aspects of ceramics uh, for dyes and other things. So almost everything had a value and people found a way to use that, even down to the ash from, you know, your water or from your, your kitchen stove. So this is a remarkable thing. And again, it's a byproduct. The rice is, was the key goal. Uh, but everything else was used uh, as much as possible. These days, you go to a farming, you know, a community, and they're basically just burning it, uh, which is too bad. Although I have an interesting story um, in my house. Um, you know, I have had a tatami room, and I was changing the tatami, and uh, and I had them outside, and and someone came by the house uh, and said, "What are you going to do with those tatami?" Uh, and as I talked to the guy, he he was a, a a minister at a Christian church nearby, and he had a project to help like homeless people and underemployed people, uh, and he would uh, buy tatami very cheaply, uh, cheaper than it cost me to. Um, oh no, I'm sorry, you wouldn't buy. It. I would have to pay him to take, but it was cheaper than having the you know, that go out as sodai gomi. Uh, and he would take them and then. Uh, had the system to cut them apart and reuse all the straw and all that stuff uh, as compost for farms. He would sell it to farms. This is remarkable. This is an Edo period approach to reuse this kind of straw and the tatami uh, reeds and stuff for, for compost. So right. uh, this stuff still does and persist. I, I think you mentioned in the book as well, and we heard from a plaster master, Kyle Holsuter, who's doing plastering in Okayama. And yeah. he sometimes uses yeah. the after tatami or the straw from the rice fields in the yes. walls, in the clay, yes. which makes it stronger. Well, straw right? was straw was was is a very important component of Japanese wall plaster and again the wall plasters this is another funny thing I mentioned the hot composting of the, the human waste but you know wall plaster is basically fermented it's kind of like compost well. they would put it in mix it in uh, it has and mix in the straw because the straw acts as a good binder but also it helps in this fermentation process to make it more sticky and uh, yes, they would definitely have uh, put a lot of straw in there. There was specific tools for chopping the straw, you know, to the right length and things that they would use. And uh, very common, and of course, good Japanese authentic wall plaster still does this. Uh, and then this can be reused later. The wall plaster is often, even after the wall gets old, they crumble that and they use a certain proportion of that in new wall plaster. Uh, so this is, you know, a, again, a continuing uh, um, approach to this, to this problem. And then talking about... Uh straw and plaster and clay leads me to mm -hmm. your uh, introducing the concept of the kamado cooker and your research yes. in Africa, applying it to African villages. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. This is because, you know, around this time before the, the disaster in 2011, I had a research project with some colleagues uh, who had spent a lot of time in Africa, particularly Zambia, uh, and Western province of Zambia, which is very underdeveloped, um, you know, near the, uh, the Zambezi River. And um, I people there were basically the, the, the production of, of fuel and cooking of fuel was really a big problem. Uh, there was a lot of deforestation going there. And this area is very prone to desertification. So uh, it was really becoming a desert, you know, over the course of one generation. Uh, so uh, we had this idea that maybe if we could introduce uh, the Kamado cook stove, that that would be one approach. And I was very fortunate to meet uh, a plaster, plasterer who had experimented with that and come up with ways to teach uh, people uh, in Africa to make a uh, kamado and, uh, and it was brilliant the way he they did it it was actually a father and son the father is in his 70s and son is in his 40s um, they would use a bag of sand and put that 
there. And then it, very simple for anybody to then put the clay uh, around that as a form and shape it. Uh, and then when it was hardened, they could just cut the bag and take out the sand and take out the bag and you had a nice Kamado. And of course, the Kamado has a lot of advantages. Basically, you can design it that it fits with your cooking pot so there's no leakage of heat around it. It, it basically retains the heat. And again, it, it can, uh, uh, you know, it's very efficient uh, in terms of other fuel use. So this was a project that we, we uh, initiated, began. Uh, Sorry to say that it never really was fulfilled in the way I would like to have fulfilled it, and the disaster happened shortly after and basically got diverted into radiation monitoring. But it's definitely something I thought. Um, I would point out that, you know, for people living in the villages uh, in a place like Western Zambia, you know, um, they actually w had some interest with that, uh, but they would prefer to just jump to using propane <laughs> or something else. You know, it's like, eh, this is still not the best solution for us. You know, we still feel like we're a little bit backwards. But, you know, I thought it was a very beautiful potential idea and could actually start a, a new sort of cultural uh, expression. Yeah, no, it was great. And I, I'm showing a, a screenshot from your NHK special where you, you talk about that project and working with mm -hmm. the potter and his innovation to design it in a way that could be replicated in Africa using the Edo era techniques. So that was that was so great to see. I love yeah, that. no, it's really interesting. And again, there's this notion, we, we have this idea of appropriate technology and uh, the highest, most developed technology, the most industrial technology is not always going to be the best solution and particular in a resource scarce environment and economically uh, deprived area. Uh, it's always going to be an issue of how to make use of 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 what's there uh, and what's easily available. And in these places, certainly, uh, you know, clay and sand and this kind of earth was very, very available. And there is a lot of cultural background to using these materials for housing and for other things. So it's a very, very familiar material, uh, which, which I thought would be done. But, you know, point out that there's at the same time, lots of beautiful projects to make solar cookers or to make, um, you know, rocket stoves, very simple stoves that are also very fuel efficient, but then still need to be made out of steel. And again, this is a very attractive approach to uh, uh, communities of, of people who feel like they're they're sort of looked down on as being backwards. So it's uh, always going to be tricky to find out what the the most attractive solution is, uh, and even often the easiest and and most environmentally sound one may not be the most attractive one to people. Yeah. Uh, one final point I'd love to touch on a little bit from your book mm. is the idea of cooperative task how kids mm. and all people in the community were always included in big projects. And if your farm had an excess of one thing, you would share it with the community and expect in return, somebody would share their excess back to you. So this whole concept of a community working together for the greater good yeah. was really interesting yeah. and definitely something we need to strive for in our communities, mm. wherever we are. I'm sure it was hard. Yeah, this but... is broke. Yeah, it's broken down. Um, you know, often this sort of thing is referred to as a gift economy, and uh, and including the exchange of labor as a gift. In Japan, the labor, you know, co collaborative or cooperative labor is called yui, uh, and a great example was uh, rethatching uh, roofs uh, of, of a farmhouse. And again, uh, you know, to in order to rethatch a roof, again. Need to point out for people to know, no, Japanese farmhouses in most places were thatched with reeds, a certain kind of something called kaya, uh, and it needs to be renewed every couple of decades, basically. Uh, and this required a lot of labor, not necessarily specialized labor. Some tasks were specialized, but basically a lot of it was stuff that almost anybody could do. Uh, so, for instance, they would take off the old thatch, and uh, the older women for instance, could be sitting down, sorting that, saying this is still usable, this we got to get rid of, and sorting that and sitting down and talking, etc. And kids could come and participate in that as well. And they're hearing about it. And why is this good? Why is that good? Uh, other things, you know, people need to climb up and and, 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 and go and, and attach the thatch. People need to, to cut the thatch from the field. And again, these fields of growing kaya were generally community resources. 
uh, not a private household. Uh, it was a shared resource. So that needed to have a certain understanding and some coordination about who's going to take care of that and how. Uh, and this was all basically cooperative. And the decisions of, of whose house needs to be rethatched and when and in what order we're going to do it would be kind of a collective decision. Of course, there's a hierarchy in the village from the headman and the, the, the village elders and the more influential families down to the lower ones. So that also played a role. But basically, they made sure that everybody who needed it would get it uh, at, at the most opportune time, if possible. There was a lot of other collective labor. Of course, you mentioned, uh, you know, at another time, you know, people going out, outside on the street to clean up and sweep up leaves and stuff that we do now. This is basically an extension of this cooperative labor. Uh, in the case of urban areas, this was the same thing. Time to clean up the street, time to clean out the, the drain, time to, you know, uh, basically, you know, go through and, 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 and do maintenance on the, the collective, you know, uh, facilities. So this was very, very common. And, and often it was broken down into groups of families who had this interdependent relationship. I mean, there was a natural way with the extended family, the relatives, and in a small village, you had a lot of, again, intermarriage and a lot of people were connected this way. And this exchange of gifts was a way of actually reinforcing those bonds. And again, we still have that. It's called susawake. Uh, you know, you go, you buy a crate, you know, a crate of apples and you distribute them to your relatives and your neighbors. And they will come back and just give you some peaches later or something. Uh, this is still going on. And this is, again, a gift economy. And it is a way of distributing a surplus. And at the time in Edo, this was much more significant than it is now. Uh, you know, we still have it, but it's not really necessary for subsistence. But in Edo, it certainly was. We had actually several economies kind of, uh, you know, operating at the same time, this gift economy of distribution of surplus. And then you had the rice economy of rice being used as tax money and then going down to the samurai who would then have to, you know, change that to money. Uh, you had the cash economy, which initially farmers were dis discouraged from participating in, but eventually did. The merchants were very, very involved with that. Uh, and these were all operating at the same time. And uh, even samurai, you know, eventually they became impoverished because their stipends, their living, you know, uh, you know, the income was, was fixed probably a generation or two prior and there was great inflation so they had a hard time making ends meet but they ended up uh, making farms in their gardens urban farms and growing food for themselves and also to distribute in the same way as people did elsewhere uh, this just this circular economy of, of surplus so it's very interesting that the you know, economy was not a purely you know capitalist thing in fact it had a lot of very non-capitalist aspects uh, within a, a sort of capitalist framework as well. So very, very interesting thing. We're seeing experiments in similar ways happening to reinforce uh, gift economies, to reinforce this sharing of surplus, uh, certainly in a lot of rural areas, to actually more systematize the um, exchange of labor. Uh, we have actually in Japan, I think there's 30 locales that have their own local currency, basically chits, you know, you get the chit, you do something for someone, you get a chit, you can use that to, to exchange for food for someone else. So this is an interesting thing happening, and not just in Japan, but other places in the world as well. It's really interesting. And uh, there's so many important examples in your book, which I think could be applied on different communities, in different ways, by individuals, by companies, by communities. If you could mm -hmm. choose one thing that you don't really see happening in modern Japan that you covered in your book or we talked about today, what, what could be one thing that you would hope to see brought back in Japan? Can you think of one? Like the sentos or the reuse of rice materials I think, or I think the idea that buildings should be built to last and and be used for a hundred years at least uh, and they should be built in a way like traditional buildings were that they could be easily modified dismantled moved etc if necessary uh, I think this idea that the scrap and build thing is so wasteful I think it's recognized now that this is a huge problem but uh, I think we need to build more permanently to have our living environment reflect, reflect the stories of our lives and our communities, where is now in place like Tokyo, things are knocked down and erased. This is constant erasure of memory and, and of our shared history. So um, I think the idea that, yes, uh, buildings are our stories, encapsulate our stories, embody our stories, uh, and our shared identity. I would like to see something shift in that direction if possible. Um, it's a big ask, but I would like to see that. 
that would be, yeah, a huge hurdle to overcome. And you have so many fantastic examples about buildings, which I know <laughs> is your passion and which I'm hoping you will come back and do an episode just on your Genius of Japanese Carpentry book. Uh, your small building, small rooms, Japan. You've got a few books mm -hmm. and a lot of research about Japanese style buildings. So I really hope you'll come back and share those with us. I'd love to. Uh, yes, let's figure out when to do that. I'm happy to talk about that too. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. And thank you everybody for joining us today. Uh, tomorrow, 1 p.m., we're talking with Helen Iwata. She is a life coach and podcaster who does Sasuga communications. So that'll be an interesting talk. Uh, please join us again. And thank you so much, Asby. That was wonderful. Thank you, JJ. Yeah. Have a great okay. day, See everyone. See you again soon. Bye. Take care.